Uh, I hope there's nobody here who's uh, an expert in Old Norse and, and doesn't like my Old Norse accent because uh, we do, uh, I'm fortunate really that nobody's ever heard it, so uh, it's fairly <laughs> safe really. Um, right, what I'm going to do is, um, I've got loads of slides and stuff, um, but what I want to do is to talk a bit about um, what Scaldic Poetry is, um, a bit about um, the uniqueness of its structure and things and what attracted me to it. Then uh, a short bit about Rodna Valdra himself, this Earl of Orkney, uh, and then do some uh, reading of the poems in both Old Norse and English, the English translations that I've made. Um, but um, that's my game plan, but there will be deviations probably if I get excited about something or because you're translators um, to highlight bits that were um, seem interesting to me about the actual process of translating um, and where occasionally where I feel I got it okay and times when I feel oh that was a mess up and uh, maybe we should I should rethink that someday but anyway we'll, we'll see how we get on I'm more than happy if people want to sort of interrupt in a nice way um, and uh, discuss if necessary and certainly at the end I hope we'll maybe get a chance to you know knock a few things around so, here we go. Uh, we're basing this on this book, Crimson the Eagle's Claw, um, which is a series of, uh, uh, well, there's actually about 42 poems in there, 32 of which were um, composed by, note I say composed by rather than written by, uh, Rodeval Cowley Tolson, because Scaldic poetry um, was um, pre writing. In, in Viking terms. Although runes existed, <coughs> familiar with runes, I was looking at the Ogams, is it, last night um, in the Stone Corridor, and there are some similarities, if you like, between the use of straight lines cut into uh, something. Um, but these poems were composed orally <coughs> and passed down. Um, and the Vikings, uh, or we should say early Scandinavians, really, had two main types of poetry, and one was the Scaldic poetry we're talking about, which is personalised, short, was designed to be read for the entertainment of kings and princes, so it's court poetry, it's aristocratic, if you like, um, as opposed to the what is called Eric poetry, which is the poetry wh wherein most of the early myths and uh, that, that we have for the early Scandinavian myths are handed down in a different type of poetry, much longer, more discursive, telling a tale, um, and about mythological subjects rather than real subjects. So I've concentrated on the Scaldic <coughs> poetry. It's primarily preserved in the um, sagas, in the Icelandic sagas, which began to be written down in the 13th century. Some of the poetry that I'm working on now was written in the 10th century, so it's had 300 years of uh, being remembered. And the memory as a, an organ, if you like, was a very different organ in those days. From It wasn't just a, a place that, by the way, basic information. Um, it was closer in a sense to our, the, the way we use imagination now. And uh, memory, therefore, was not just about fact, storing facts. It was about um, keeping stories and cultures going. Um, the idea of these poems, which are very, as you'll see in a minute, are very tight knit, is that once they were made, because of the very complex structure, their contents would remain fixed because the structure was so fixed. And so, if you if you got a bit of it wrong in terms of alliteration and stuff like that. It didn't work as a poem, um, and therefore it uh, didn't hold the information. That's what scholars think. I'm not terribly convinced, actually, um, because cause my memory doesn't operate the way their memory operates, and I have to find some other types of poetry more easy to remember. But we'll come back to that. There's over 5,000 of these poems surviving, and there's a major international project at the moment which is putting them all together and actually putting them online at this moment. Um, the Scaldic Project, just bang that in and uh, you'll see. Um, and um, I was lucky enough to be, when I did my PhD, 
PhD to uh, have one of my tutors, one of the guys who was heavily involved in this Delta project, so that helped nourish my enthusiasm. So, why was I enthusiastic? Um, I think what we'll do is look at a poem, and then you'll start to see what the attractions and horrors also of this particular type of poetry are. So I'm going to try this bit of technology, see if it works. I'm going to stand over here so I can see, see what's happening. Yeah. Right. Rognabalder. I'll tell you more about him a bit later. I think you need to know about the poetry first. But this is allegedly written when he was 15, and his poems are all uh, collected in the opening of saga as part of the narrative. So the poems were written before the saga and then included in the saga, uh, and the saga was written in Iceland by monks, and that may have a significant, um, may have had a significant effect on the content. We don't really know. There's nothing to say about that. So he's on a trading trip to Grimsby, centre of the universe, what we see in those days, from Bergen in Norway, because he was Norwegian. Um, so I'll read the two poems and then we'll, we'll talk a bit about how they're made. Ver hirtham batna lerner, vikur fem megin grimmar, saur vassar vant ed verum, vithra i grimsboi mithium, nus tax mos of mirar, megin kak liga lertum, branda el a vildur, diognyak to dinya. Muck, slime, mud. We waited for five mired weeks, reeking, silt-foul, bilge board souring in Grimsby Bay. Nimbly now, our proud, proud, bergen-bowed sea elk pounds over wave-paved oak moors. Locks horns with foam crests, bows booming. It's a very resonant type of poetry, as you can see. All the Scaldic poems are made like this, eight lines, each with six syllables, so there's 48 syllables to the stanza. That's the, the first thing. In fact, as soon as I say that, if you read the first two lines of the Old Norse, you'll find there's probably seven syllables. So rules are made to be broken, and they often were. Um, I was hard on myself, and I think these are all six syllables in this particular poem. Um, if you look um, at the first two lines, uh, of the Old North. We've got Bauer, Vatna, and then at the beginning of the second line, Vikur, an alliteration pattern which is supposed to be inviolable. Um, and basically two uh, alliterating vowels in the, in the first uh, line, which are on stressed syllables, um, and a third one at the beginning of the fourth line, or, near, or being the first stress in the, in the second line, rather. Um, so, if we turn to the English, um, we've got uh, muck, mud, and mire uh, as they attempt to follow the literating plan. Um, <coughs> go back to the Old Norse, we've got um, half rhymes on syllables in the first line and full rhyme on syllables in the second line. So, um, you've got bower at the beginning and layer at the end. And in the second line, so bower there the half lines, you've got uh, trim and grim. Okay? Um, uh, the attempt here is not particularly good. Mud and wave, um, weak and, and reek. So again, there's an attempt to uh, keep the, the pattern. Now that pattern goes through all the lines, so the, work, the lines work in pairs, if you like. Um, then each line um, is meant to end um, with a drum shape, so for boom boom rather than for boom, uh, which is what we're used to actually. Um, so Leero, Megan Grima, Burum, Mithyam, we're not meant to put a stress syllable on the very last end of the line. Um, I have done in various places, partly expedient, but also partly to make emphasis where I felt it was necessary. So, that's just the beginning of a very, very tight structure. And when I came across this by accident, long before I was doing the PhD, um, I also came across George Mackay Brown's 
uh, version two of six of these poems and his comment that it's impossible to replicate the form. And that was, for me, that was red rank and blue. I thought, well, it must be, so let's do it. But nobody has actually done it before with all the set of poems. Um, and it's, like all poetry, it results in compromise, it results in all sorts of different effects. Effects. Um, that word is relevant right at this minute. Um, I just want to say something about <coughs> crabs. Why have I decided, why did I decide to try and replicate the form? What's the point of that? Um, my feeling was quite strongly that this, I, I term this exoskeletal poetry in the sense that its skeleton, i.e. the form that we've just discussed, is on the outside uh, holding the content in, in exactly the same way as a crab. And if you take this crab and take his shell away and take away his claws, take the armour off his legs and stuff, you're left with this wee blob inside, which can be very tasty and very beautiful, but isn't very crab-like. And that's what I felt about many of the attempts I saw of people translating skeletal poetry, and I wanted to crab back, because that gives a real sense of what was going on. That isn't something which I would then take and apply to all poetry, because not all poetry is exoskeletal. I've forgotten what the biological term is, perhaps someone could tell me, for people like us who've got our bones inside rather than outside. But you know what I'm getting at. Um, different types of poetry, different approaches when it comes to translation. Um, okay. Kennings. We're all familiar with Kennings up to a point. The Whale Road. Um, the, uh, the Ship of the Desert. We all know that that's a camel. Okay. Um, and there are lots of other modern ones we use just um, without thinking about it, like describing your car as a gas guzzler. Uh, Kennings in Old Norse took a particular form. There was always a noun, there was always two nouns, one of them in the genitive. Um, and then there is uh, the thing that they refer to. And the point was not to say the thing that is being referred to. And the, what happens then is you get a great layering of pictures which come together to um, give a much, which give you much more of the experience of what's being talked about rather than the thought of what's being talked about. So, there are 255 pennies discovered so far for, for, for the sea in Old North. Now, obviously, this is a seafaring, seafaring people. So, Salt Meadow um, is a very obvious way, way, why that would be Kenny. An Orc Moor. This is quite typical, uh, and, and of the poem that we just read, in fact, in that they take disparate things, things from the land and things from the sea, and put them together. Um, so the ship of the desert, again, again, is an example of that, where you're taking things which are not normally combined, and combining them, and therefore making a third element. Because you've got the images, the dry land images, and you've got the, the sea images, and you've got this third thing that they've just made. Um, the eel playing, well, oh, the, the, you, you can make them up yourself. Great fun. Um, ship, fairly obvious ones, 89 of those we know about. Warriors, they're always quite talking about warriors and chopping each other to bits, and we'll come to that soon, but um, the, there are lots of words for warriors. Uh, blade tree, the tree is often um, uh, a way of describing a man. I will see in another poem that they've got limbs, we've all got limbs and trunks and ground sometimes uh, and we stand up like, like the tree. So there are there is a logic to where these are put together. Um, woman prop of embroidery. <laughs> um, a prop is used a lot and a prop is a, a po poetic term because it refers to the third element in the um, alliteration pattern is, is called the prop. It holds the rest up. Um, but it also um, describes something on which uh, uh, we, we've got hawks somewhere there, a cliff of hawks. Why would a woman be a cliff of hawks? Walk, she walks around an aristocratic woman with a hawk on her arm. And hawks normally are on cliffs, so, so. so Okay, 
So you're making pictures all the time, and you're putting these pictures together. So the poem becomes a much a many layered set of pictures rather than just one set, one image doing for one work. And I love that. And it's how poetry works anyway, uh, up to up to point. So they are masters at these. There are there are lots and lots of them. But you can you can hold a whole class of getting people to make up new ones. Um, bearing in mind that you've got a noun, a second nine, which is in the general, so that one describes the other, but they come together and make a third element. Everyone quite happy with that? Yeah. So we're going to hear a few more canons as we go along, so you can have uh, a bit of fun trying to spot them as we, uh, as we get there, or work out what they are. Rogner Margaret. Now, I'm not going to read all this out because that's a bit silly, but it's just to tell you a bit about the 12th century, first half of the, uh, the century. Um, he was Norwegian, aristocratic Norwegian. Um, his mother had connections with Orkney, and so did um, uh, her brother Magnus, who became Saint Magnus. He was canonized. And Rognavaldra, when he succeeded to the earldom, did so uh, with lots of political shenanigans. And one of the things he promised to do was to build a cathedral. And Kirk Walter the cathedral is still there. He founded it back in the 12th century, and indeed his remains are there, as are those of Magnus, his uncle. Um, and he's probably remembered most for the cathedral. But his poetry, one scholar has written that there's a strong argument to say that what he left us in terms of poetry is as strong an achievement and of lasting value as the cathedral is. And uh, which, which I think is a marvellous thing to say, and I think there's a lot of truth in it. This kind of poetry is, has kind of been lost to Europe, really. Very few people know about it, except in um, scholarly circles. Um, partly because um, Europe went down the, the classical route, if you like, in terms of how it thinks about the world, and how its literature is, and, and where all its science came from, etc. And the northern religions and the northern ways of thinking of doing things gradually got uh, sidelined. Um, so, I suppose part of my ambition is to bring Scaldic poetry back to the fore so that people can see there's this astonishingly crafted work going on, going on, which has very much got the kind of interlacing sense of the um, jewellery and stuff that they made as well. Um, there are links. I was going to circulate this, I forgot to make a slide of this, but it just shows a page of manuscript um, from Flachia book, which is where um, these poems are found. And the point about it is, is that they didn't write them out like, uh, like we write out poetry. You can't actually tell where the poems are, except in this, there's a tiny, I've underlined it down the bottom, there's a tiny mark in the, in the um, margins. Um, vellum was a, <coughs> an expensive stuff to be playing with. Um, so, uh, uh, we have a visual sense of poetry as well as an oral sense of poetry. Um, they didn't. Right. Can, can I just ask you there, Ian? They didn't delineate the poems then at all? No. Mm -hmm. We know about their structure because there are three grammatical treatises which were written at certain times in the 13th century. Um, and there's also a, a, a thing called the Poetic Edda, written by a guy called um, Sturluson. Um, and he outlines all the rules, if you like, for Scaldic poetry, gives examples of them all. And Rognavaldra, in fact, had done similar before him. He was a scholar too, and he had written a treatise on... Um, but it's so, in manuscript form, it's so badly damaged that there's never even been an edition of it brought out for people to see. Um, but he was, he was some man. So we better go on to him. Um, this is just an illustration from the book, which is in sections. Um, right, an early bragging poem. A few things to say about this, but I'll, I'll read the poem first. Uh, again written when he was, uh, they reckon, about 15. <coughs> and this is him really saying, hey, look at me, guys. I'm someone to reckon with, okay? Uh, so here he goes. Taf lamp er a pechla, it threatier kank new. Tinik trifler runum, teeth smear bolk of smithier. 
Strich mir Tank aus Skittern, Skitter und Kreuz bauten die Tiere. Ein Weg weg ihr, dann kriegt ihr Abschluss vom Traktortür. Full challenge my name skills. I'm champion at chess, canny recalling runes, well read, a red hot smith. Some say I shoot and ski and skull skillfully too. Best of all, I've mastered heart play and poetry. Now this is the most famous of his poems. It's also the easiest. There's no, there's no kenning to it for a start. Um, <coughs> secondly, it's the only place we have reference to the kind of attributes that would be expected of um, a, a Scandinavian earl of the period. So historically, it's of great value. Um, it, um, chess is not quite right. Tafra at the beginning is actually a board game. Uh, so technically it should be a board game, and Tafla is a board game which the British Museum reproduced when they did their big Viking exhibition. I have a cop copy of this game at home, it's a bit like drafts, but uh, with different rules. Um, yeah, this, the other thing that I wanted to say about that is heart play. Um, it's a, one of the only two or three references that there are to musical instruments. Um, in the, the whole canon of Old Norse poetry, and there is almost no archaeological evidence of there having been musical instruments. So we don't actually know if these poems were set to music and it was played with a harp, for example, but here he is boasting that he's got that skill. Um, so it remains, again, an intriguing possibility that we have so far got no further evidence to say they were set to music or played with music or was the music done at a different time? We don't know. Um, right. The, that sounds a very commonplace title, but what's odd and beautiful about this man's poetry is that he wrote about all sorts of things, not just about the great battles, and not just about women or whatever. He wrote about little things that happened in life. Um, Look at me, I'm using the word rope. Rope should not be allowed. It, it, it composed. And yet, people memorize them and pass them on. So, I've got one or two here which are about daily instance, uh, things that happen. In this one, they're passing a tapestry, I mean, these men, and there's an old man in the tapestry, sewn into the tapestry, and they make, he makes a poem about it, and he challenges two of his fellow poets also to make poems about it, but not to use any of the words that he uses. So, Odi in Litli Grunsen is another poet. Um, so this one is uh, Roger Lauber's uh, version. Leitra of Irksu Seis Uta, Aldroin Stendra Chaldi, Sig Freis Velnis Baura, Slith Verdant Offen Rita, Eke Mund der Eugier, Or Baitanda Reitis, Brick Rustra Botar Jokla, Fainrendra Framra Ganga. There in the freeze, frozen, fighting times, tight wefted weave, stands old age, rigid, arm raised. His blades, needling, icicle gleams, shimmer in an arrow shower, braving Berserk's eyes. Move! Old Bandy still standing. Um, now, I, I took a liberty here, and I made the figure old age. I think I was going through one of those days when I was feeling old age myself, and what a battle it is, you know, so um, it came into the poem. Um, I've underlined the word raised because, um, now let's look, this is what Oddie replied. Raised again. I failed the, cha the challenge, and I used the word raised in both both versions. So um, ideally, I would be changing that. Um, so Ori said, "Stendra or higre a kugva, et illutra mesperti, bandalfra baiti rindi, baldras with dear achaldi, fear mon han mekjerti, hautra nus maul at saitis, loindendra rehtiska." The sea girt steel kirtled tapestry elf stands stoop shouldered, 
sword raised boldly, war struck by the door. Men fear his swordsmanship. Make peace now, wave racers. Heel skis, surf down rollers, or suffer injury. Uh, so we have two, two uh, poets writing about the same thing, and here we come up with the, 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 the differences. Okay? Right. A lunatic breaks his restraint and tries to topple Rotorog. Now, why would a man whose position as ever was fairly precarious, precarious in the sense that if you turn your back at the wrong time, you get stabbed, <laughs> there was that kind of society at that time. Um, why did he write about this sort of stuff? Well, I think it's wonderful. Fecky, Pilkiskiku, Pangram Ligra Uthangi, Rekra Re Harta Knitya, Hildingi Fe Milgum, Stetra Bastaula Vyaki, Staka Kbutu Gram Nurka, Atla Hefra Egyas Hilfler, Orfandra Fear Higandi. Some fool let a felon. Vice-fisted, rope-wristed, grip your yarrow's cloak, grapple the gift tree. Friends, swift to save him, say he stumbled, yet stood. The madman had brawn, not brain. Our language brawled from his mouth, gall stained. The fastidious poet who brawled from his mouth, you know. Um, gift tree. An earl, a, a, a great man, was supposed to be a giver of goods. It was a gift tree. The mean ones got slagged off by, uh, by their retainers and, and lost retainers. And Rogerald was very good at it. So he refers to himself as a gift tree. Um, which he did is, uh, they're not modest, the scouts. Um, this one is the final one I wanted to look at because... He is, he's been away for three years. He's come back. He left other people in charge. And there's dissent and there's mutterings and all the rest of it. Who did, these poems normally were read out to his mates or public or the whole court or whatever. This kind of poem is more like, it's more, it's more like a diary entry than it is like a poem to be recited to other people. Returning to over here, he is a faction of dissent. Councils himself. Nu hafe Göttinger gengit Göttjörn estat Jörna ob Grafas kilvrth Grafa Eurit Murk ad Sori. Ad Sori. Dat Monteki Shakna Thame as Spik Bitra Hema. Stigam late thou lagen leg methan ob Helskegi. Now even the noblest need watching. Trusts breeders embrace arch blasphemers. Even friends' oaths turn evil. Let them fear the slow flaring fumes of your cautiously stooped and lightly stepping stealth while your beard's healthy. Another way of saying why you're still alive. <laughs> One of the great ironies is that he died uh, in an attack and his face was slashed open and uh, part of his jaw knocked off. So it's slightly sort of prophetic little sentiment here, isn't it? Um, so, um, but that throws up an interesting point. If you look in the, um, the Old Norse, we've got leg there to rhyme with skeggy. Okay? Um, the, the very choice of this, this idea about the beard may well just be that he needed a rhyme for leg and skeggy, skeggy beard, um, came up just as I need a rhyme for stealth, I came up with help. Okay? And that's part of making poetry, isn't it? It's fine, it, particularly if you're working to a form, it's, it's having to find the ways of saying um, which hold that form and which also give not just the idea, but give, um, how do I put this? It's a strong sense. Why you be as healthy is a lovely way, from my perspective, of saying quite a lot um, about life and death, really, in a sense. It's a, it's a wonderful way for a man of defining life while you be as healthy, you know. Um, so, and, and also it's about manhood, isn't it? Having a beard in the first place. Right, this is the stuff that you came for, really. What the Vikings do, they go charging around the seas, uh, attacking people. So here they are, in the Mediterranean.
Bethania. They are, by the way, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Um, and they sailed from Norway um, all the way. Um, one of the interesting things is that the saga writer describing the voyage and interspersing it with the uh, poems uh, gets the geography wrong. He clearly knew names from the roots that were well known, but didn't, couldn't picture them. Uh, and you'll see in another poem uh, the effect that had. But here they pack a drone, which is a North African merchant ship, as it says there. He praises Erlingra and exults in the bloodshed and victory. Erlingra you'll meet again. He was brother-in-law of the King of Norway. Um, one of the great honours was to be remembered as a warrior, and particularly to be a warrior at the, at the front, the one who got on the enemy ship first, etc. So, here we go. Erlingra gek thars okur, erg sterkre rupus gmerki, reigre met fremte of sigri, flemundre at gremandi, lethem vaur en dita, bas bleth numet jethem, spet ruth, spet ruthus naplia firta, snurk, blaumana gertam. How our bloodstained standards stream, Erlingre, extreme in terror, Blade bristler bombards the doomed Roman. Our spears cause suffering, spread Saracen gore. Red drenched blades clinch bone boldly. We stack slain black sailors. Um, there's no holding back on, on the, um, the achievement, if you like, of slaughtering all the guys on the ship, which is what uh, we're told they did. And this is another one. Uh, from the same action, except this is in praise of Austin the Red, um, who is deemed to be first aboard the African crew Dromon. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the attack actually, we're told, took place with six ships, six Viking um, galleys, three on each side. So it would be impossible for any one of the Vikings to know who was first on the ship because they couldn't see the ones around the other side. Um, but here we have Outen being praised for being the first. And what the saga tells us is that after the battle, when they sat discussing it, they couldn't agree who'd been the first. Um, so Rogner Valdre, as the chief guy, said, well, I think it was Outen, so it is Outen. And that's how history is made. We still have that as the historical version, if you like, this encapsulated. And Outen still has the honor of being remembered. Um, whereas X doesn't, you know. So um, history is always a compromise. The winners always choose it, obviously. But in this case, the leaders decide what will be um, fact and what is fiction, and not much has changed, really, has it? Get out the Roman duck van, drink the red snap till Fenya. Up met our new cappy, out and fiestra in Rugby. Thar nuthi ver fjurtha vi hefra aldar do thvalde. Bolra fechtla blara thilja blöthi vöfna at vjurtha. Our avidly Othan's heart beat for fame. Claiming all hell bent on bounty, he reddened the drone. Christ, irresistible, his cause as the kisses of blood-lipped blades leads us. Black trunks deck the soaked board. Now, a few things about this translation, because I've been a bit naughty in it. Um, firstly, you'll see that Christ isn't actually mentioned in here. He is mentioned as God says. But why have I used Christ? Because of the, in, the rhyme with cis, irresistible, right? Why have I used irresistible? I have to confess but I love the idea of having a five-syllable word in a six-syllable line. Uh, so, so there it is. Um, also, uh, then, that led to tampering with the last line, because having done that, black trunks, deck, so forth, bang, 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 bodies falling down, right? Um, but with contrast with the, the rhythm here, it just all seemed um, to work quite well, without going too far, by the way, from the, what actually is said in the old note. In the north. Um, Can I ask, uh, is it okay to ask a, a question just about your? I was just wondering the, the, the different requirements of the exoskeleton. Are you kind of prioritizing the rhyming? You know the way wasn't it in, in the original? It was like two um, uh, alliteration of two in the first line and then one in the second line. You don't always follow that. Do, do you? You depart from that sometimes. 
I do. Well, well, I try not to. I'm very upset that you noticed. <laughs> well, I'm not sure it could be that I'm missing the subtlety of... No, 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 you're not missing something. You're, you're looking at this, and we, we do have two A's here. Credit where credit's due, right? But we don't have we don't have a vowel in this one, right? Now, I, this is where another confession has to come in. And this goes... I don't know how far back this goes in, in, in my development as some, somebody who is supposed to know something about literature. But I had always understood that... H was allowed to be a vowel when you were doing alliteration. So, here it is. <laughs> but, I'm wrong. Okay? So, um, but I think it works quite well, so it's staying. <laughs> that's, that's what it comes down to in the end. The, I, I, I have been quite tight, but not as... Um, uh, if you go for the, the, the Straight jacket. Um, you, you, you are completely straight jacketed. <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, so, yeah. But I think you should take the, a black mark there for me. That's quite right. Can you explain a bit what, like, I, I think I, I am missing. So it, when you talk about vowels, like, it, it always seems to be with, with the, you know, uh, with the consonants. But, but I, it, so is, is the alliteration a mixture of vowels and consonants? No, alliterate, vowels alliterate with each other. So, an, an A can alliterate, A, E, I, O, U, are alliterative uh, in Old Norse and in English, in fact. So, so you're not, uh, quite often you seem to have, say, two, you know, 